right. I'm back. I'm back from Puerto Rico, everybody. I took a little vacation and then the week before that, I had to actually finish all of my real job work. So I have a ton of ideas for different videos uh, covering different people, but the easiest one for me to make, to be honest, is another Rachel Hollis video because I have the most information, the most familiarity with their situation. They seem to be updating things like every single second there's something new to talk about. So um, while I want to cover other people, other gurus and other um, self-help influencers and people who are exploiting their children online, um, those are going to take me a little bit longer to put together because I want to do a really good job with them. The first update like we're going to talk about is Rachel Hollis is selling tickets to her Rise conference um, from what? It looks like online, it does not look like it's going very well. So basically, Rachel Hollis had the Rise conference um, scheduled, but then she had Toilet Gate, and then everything blew up, and so she decided to postpone it. So then they decided to switch it to this Labor Day date in September, um, but because of everything that blew up, a lot of her regular speakers canceled bail, did not want to be associated with her because obviously it's not great to be um, unrelatable. They, you know, they want to be relatable to their audience, unlike Rachel. So anyway, so a lot of speakers have been dropping out um, and so then they just basically said that they're going to look at the roster again, start over, learn from their experiences. I think it's just, it's very muddled at this point as to what this conference is supposed to be about. So let's look at the lineup. So the lineup is Rachel Hollis, of course, the number one um, self-help guru in the world. Love her, can't relate, but love her. Trent Shelton, so he's been associated with Rachel for a few years now. He's a former NFL player. Um, he does a lot of like motivational speaking. They seem to be tight. He's number two on the list. Chris Hogan, I guess he had a thing where he got fired from um, Dave Ramsey's show for adultery or something. Allegedly, I don't really know that whole story, but um, kind of controversial, but he's a best-selling author and personal finance expert. Then we got Ellen Yin, who's an entrepreneur, business coach, podcaster. I've never heard of her, but you know, uh, maybe I, I'm not like hip to all the influencers. Erin Lee Smith, let's see her. Okay, she's a makeup artist and she does hair and she's got some celebrities. I wonder if this person came from Rachel's new boyfriend, who I won't speculate, I guess, because that's against the rules, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what the rules of society are. Like, I think I know who it is, who her boyfriend is, but I don't know for sure. So I could just say allegedly it's this guy, but I guess I won't until it's official, just in case. But um, he, he, I believe her boyfriend is, is involved in the entertainment business on the management side. Um, so he probably would have contacts for makeup artists and such. So maybe, you know, she was struggling to fill the roster and uh, her boyfriend helped out. But who knows? That's just a speculation. Not necessarily true. Kia Twistleman. Okay, so she's a health coach and speaker. But if you follow the Rachel Hollis story very closely, this woman was on Kelly Clarkson's show, The Kelly Clarkson Show, the show that Kelly Clarkson hosts, and um, she had lost a bunch of weight and credited Rachel Hollis for helping her because she read her book and then she lost weight um, and she had a nice transformation. And so on The Kelly Clarkson Show, they brought Rachel Hollis on as a surprise and they got to meet and whatever. So she's speaking at the conference. Gianna Francis is one of the coaches that were part of Rachel and Dave's fitness app that like has basically <laughs> evaporated into thin air. Um, they were talking about it for a long time, promoting it. And then the pandemic happened, so fair enough. But also because of all the scandals, they literally got divorced. And so I think they're just trying to like bury it in the corner. But I guess she was a uh, lead trainer on the app. And then more speakers coming soon. So that, you know, they said more are coming soon, but it's kind of getting down to the wire. It's already end of July, really, at this point. Um, so we'll see, I don't know. Uh, I, I have a feeling that, you know, it might get canceled. But another reason that um, 
things are not going great is that the ticket prices are really high. The cheapest ticket you can get, in, so this is an in-person event, so the cheapest in-person you can get is $800, um, which is terrace, which I guess is like nosebleed seats. If you're not into balcony seating, you can go to general admission. It gets you mezzanine access, a little bit closer to the action for $1,000. Then the next ticket goes up to Premier. 1500 gets you floor access and then the VIP. So if you're like a very important person, uh, $2,000, you get front row seats. Okay, that sounds better. Um, exclusive VIP cocktail party, meet and greet photo op ah, with Rachel, um, and a Rise gift card. Okay, and some coaching stuff. All right, so that's to me very high priced. A lot of people on Facebook were not happy about that. Um, but you can also go virtual. So you could do that for $250. I mean, again, that's three days, so it's a little bit cheaper, but it's literally gonna be on like Zoom. <laughs> so you can watch the video from your house for $250. It doesn't look like, according to Ticketmaster, that tickets are selling very fast. So available is blue, right? So that's a lot of availability. Um, there's still time left, obviously, but I mean, uh, it doesn't look good. One podcast that we're gonna talk about now uh, is about how Rachel witnessed on a run, uh, on, on her run, so she was on a run, and she witnessed someone dying, okay, uh, in front of her, somehow within her vision, she could analyze the entire scene and decide, you know, the ages of the paramedics and the, the dynamics between them. Um, it was quite bizarre. And of course, the lesson in there about this scene happening in front of her is that she was meant to be there and it was a reminder about her life. <laughs> We're gonna go through that, break that down in just a second, but that's the preview of that podcast. I do need to mention though, uh, that Dave Hollis and Heidi Powell, the power couple <laughs> of the moment, um, no, they're not, they're really annoying, but um, they went on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, uh, which was in reality a white savior um, photo op for them and they went to help with this nonprofit, which I guess the nonprofit takes people into the communities that they help serve and show them around and like show them basically like, oh, look at all the things we're doing and it's great, it's helpful, I guess. I'm not well, super well versed in like the harms that nonprofits can do in developing countries, but just from optics alone, they looked like fools <laughs> over there. I think there's a lot to unpack when it comes to white people specifically. And just so the for the record, I am white, I am a woman. Um, I feel like I'm okay to speak about other white women, <laughs> hopefully, um, in, a, in a critical way, but also in a let's find a solution way uh, about this topic. And uh, I wanna save that for like a more comprehensive video. So I wanted to mention it here that I did see it. I think it's ridiculous. Um, but I'm not gonna like go into it as much as I'm gonna go into Rachel's podcasts in this episode. So, without further ado, this one came out June 18th. It's called, I Don't Believe in Coincidence. Okay, so, um, and there's a trigger warning on it uh, for, trigger warning for death and not being alive by your own choices. Okay, all right, so this is what the description says. Hey guys, I had something on my heart that I felt like I needed to share with you as a bonus episode, and for the first time ever, I will need to give y'all a trigger warning. This episode is about death, dying, first responders, and all that goes with that. You know me, this won't be purely negative. <sighs> you know me, this won't be purely negative, because I love to talk about finding the good in really hard things. And I wasn't going to talk about this experience, but I felt like it was important to share it with y'all. She's really hitting at y'all. And she, she claims she's from the South, but she's from Bakersfield, California. So I don't know where this y'all came from. 
Maybe it's more like Western y'all, less Southern y'all, but I digress. I want to honor those who are there in our final moments and talk about when things, oh, sorry, and talk about times when we pour energy into others and don't get the result we so desperately want. All right, so it's 17 minutes. Um, we don't have to listen to the whole thing, but I think it's important to listen to the majority and break it down because there is such um, an amount of self-satisfaction and in my opinion, um, overt exhibition narcissism that is presented in this um, that I think it deserves some analysis. So let's do it. I am sitting in my bedroom floor with a cup of coffee. It is early morning and something is on my heart and I just keep thinking about it. And so I thought maybe I would do like a short form podcast and kind of tell you guys what I'm thinking in the hopes that maybe it'll give you something to chew on as well. So this intro, um, and I've heard her say this a few times, and a lot of people use this terminology, but I really think it's important to point out how um, it could be interpreted as religious undertones. So Rachel's father was or is a, a preacher, evangelical preacher. Um, and so to say something like this, like something's been on my heart, tell a personal story, but then tie it back into the sermon or the lesson of the week, is a familiar storytelling device to do. Um, you know, it, it makes it seem, the, the verses in the Bible, or it makes the lesson seem a little bit more palatable when you use a personal story to tie it back into something. So I think that's what she's doing here. She's like, something's on my heart. I just, I don't want to share it, but I have to share it. Um, it's setting you up to think like, oh, wow, like, she doesn't want to express this, but she feels so compelled, you know, maybe by God's hand to do this. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off of you for like people to say, why are you sharing this again? Like, what's the point of this story? It almost takes that away and says, well, you know, I felt it was on my heart. Something, the angels were telling me to do this. It's not my fault. You know, I was just a listener. I was just an ear to, the higher beings. I will also say I have, in the four years I've recorded this podcast, I have never said this before, but for the first time ever, I'm going to give a trigger warning. I had this thing happen yesterday that was very triggering for me, which is what I'm gonna talk about now, and it could be triggering for you. So I'm going to talk about death and dying and paramedics and everything surrounding that. So I don't even like saying those words for you right now because it uh, makes me feel a certain kind of way because of my past. And so if that is something that is going to make you feel a certain kind of way, then this probably isn't an episode for you to listen to. And I just want to give you that before I jump in. Uh, I promise that, uh, you know me, it's not going to be negative or too sad, but it's it's definitely something that might uh, throw you off. So that was your last warning. <laughs> I'm going to jump in now. Yesterday, I had this really crazy experience and at first, I wasn't going to talk about it because it was so upsetting for me that I thought, you know, I don't ever want to put things out in the world that are upsetting to other people. I want to try and spread joy and positivity. But I also think I know that there are lessons even in the hardest things. And yesterday was really hard for me. So I decided I would I would talk to you guys about it here on the show. So I guess we have to start with the fact that I wasn't supposed to be in town yesterday. That That's a piece that's really important. That's the piece that's really important here. Um, no, it's not in my opinion. I mean, plans change, things change. She's, she's going to say, I've listened to this podcast a couple times. What she's about to say here is that she was supposed to be in New York for work, but something happened and she had to cancel. So instead of being in New York, she happens to be on her run on a day where she's supposed to actually be out of town. Um, to a normal person, it's a coincidence, but Rachel Hollis doesn't believe in coincidences, apparently, according to this. Um, so, you know, she was brought here for a reason to witness this man die. <laughs> Every intricacy of his life, that person that she's going to be talking about soon, um, who's dying in front of her, uh, it, well, it was all leading up for Rachel to be there to witness it. That, that's what gave his life meaning. I was actually meant to go to New York for work and then at the last minute, I had to cancel my trip because I had things here in Austin that uh, I couldn't shift around. And so I found myself, um, it was a Sunday and my trip had gotten canceled in the morning. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm up because I had to cancel all this stuff. And so I'm going to go do my run. And yesterday I decided I was going to do the whole uh, circle, which is about 10 miles. This is like a nitpick, but like 
you're talk the point of the story that you're telling is like someone was dying in front of you and you watch them it happen and you have to mention how many miles you were running like come on like she always i feel like every time she talks about running she has to say like oh it's 10 miles it's 10 miles like we don't care and i come around a bend and there are i mean six fire trucks four ambulances cop cars lights on sirens off just all kind of parked and i'm already having a problem. I, I assume if you're listening to this podcast that you've read my books. And so maybe you know that my older brother committed suicide when I was 14 and I found him. And that morning in my life is obviously really awful and traumatic. And I have uh, PTSD and I've done so much therapy and like have learned to manage it really well, but there are still things in, that will absolutely trigger me. And ambulances and fire trucks and that scene that I jogged into yesterday is 100% one of those things because it reminds me of what it looked like outside of our house that day. So I come around this corner and I see all of this, but I can't tell why. And now two things happen here and I'm going to speak. I, I hope this makes sense. But if you have ever gone through something like I went through, I don't know if you handle it in the same way, but now I feel like my brain is like, what is going on? Like, I want to be able to understand what is going on so that I can tell myself that it's okay. And I'm at this, like, I can't, the trail is they like put up yellow caution tape and I can't like go on the trail. So I have to go around what's happening, but I'm also like trying to figure out what's going on because there is this, at least for me, desire to like understand, because if I can understand what has happened, then I feel like on some level, I can calm myself down. Your brain does this thing where it tries to like find an answer for something that's scary. And that's what it was trying to do. So I go away around, I'm, you know, on, not on the trail. I have to like sort of loop around, but as I'm looping around, I just want to say one more time, trigger warning. Like as I loop around, I see that there, there's like a group of maybe 12 first responders. And one of them is doing chest compressions on someone and the rest are just watching. And what I'm looking at is this young, I think paramedic who is trying so hard to revive someone who is no longer with us. How do you know? Like, how does she know that? She says, oh, this young paramedic is trying so hard to revive someone who's no longer with us. Are you a medical professional? Are you a medical examiner? How can you tell from your vantage point, which I'm assuming if there's yellow caution tape is at some length away that you're not staring over the gurney as this is happening, how can you tell that he's no longer with us? And I'm watching the other first responders who are just sort of like, we're going to let this kid try, even though there's no, there's no hope. So now she's going to decide what all the other paramedics are thinking as well. So not only has she decided that the person on the gurney is dead, the person doing the chest compressions is trying so hard to no avail um, and has some sort of complex that he needs to keep trying. And that um, all the other paramedics watching are knowing that there's no hope, but they're going to um, watch this young kid uh, paramedic do it anyways. That's a lot of assumptions <laughs> in one scene. Um, that is unfolding in front of you in real time. Ah, I think here what she's trying to do is set it up so that she can now explain how this scenario fits in her life and also in your life. And uh, you're going to hear that as, as this unfolds. But I don't even know if this is real. I looked it up on the twit, like on where she lives, Austin, or at least Austin metro areas, uh, EMT Twitter, which lists like every call they go on. I didn't see anything on the day that she claims this happened. Not to say it didn't happen, I just didn't see any, any evidence of it actually happening. So could it be something that she has come up with purely to tell a story um, that she wants to tell? Possibly. Um, is that in her wheelhouse? Yes, I think so. Um, so let's continue. It's gonna, it's now gonna get to the part where she connects it back to a life lesson. Like, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. There is not a world where only one person is still trying to do something and everybody else is just standing there. And it was horrible. It was so horrible. And I just, um, I stopped where I was on the trail and I just prayed for everybody in that circle. I prayed for the person who was no longer with us. And I prayed for that young paramedic who was working so hard, who was trying so hard. And I prayed for the team around him who was going to have to, at some point, 
help him to stop trying. And I felt like so, oh God, like so terrible and like so many emotions of like, oh, like, oh, I, I, I just was, it was horrible. Okay, so that's what happened. In this scenario, I believe Rachel thinks she's the paramedic who's trying, the young paramedic who's trying, because she's gonna now explain how um, sometimes you try so hard to keep something alive for so long um, that you need help to stop and to give up. And I think this is gonna now tie back into her marriage that the marriage is the dead man on the gurney, her marriage. She, Rachel is the one trying to resuscitate it constantly, which may or may not be true. I don't know. It seems like unlikely in what I've heard about their marriage, but okay. Um, and then uh, the fans and the people around her in her life are the, are the other paramedics just watching and not helping her. Um, that's what I think is setting up here. So I, I prayed and then I kept walking because I felt like I don't want to, I don't want to draw attention to this and I don't want to like be a someone trying to watch and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I couldn't, like I carried it with me for the rest of the day and I have, I have it still. This happened yesterday morning and I'm still sitting with this thing and asking myself why I saw that. Why? Why I saw that. This is the part that I struggle with the most is because like, why did I see that? Like what, what lesson can I glean? And there's a really good quote if you've seen, I know I've talked about this before, but if you've seen the Bo Burnham special where Sacco is explaining the how the world works, there's a line that he says that's like, why do, and it says white people specifically, but I think anyone really, um, why do white people have to look at every issue through the myopic lens of how it helps them become a better person? So any issue like racism or sexism or uh, you know, the perils of homelessness. Like it's, you can never just, people can never just look at it as the issue that it is. They have to look at the issue as how did I help contribute um, to making it better? Or how can I be a better person because now I understand more about homelessness? It's, it's never just without them attached to it. And I think that's exactly, perfectly, um, aligned with what Rachel's saying here. How, why did I witness this? As opposed to this is a thing that happened and it happens all the time, whether I'm there or not. Um, thousands of people die, probably, I don't know how I many people die a day, but there's people dying, especially right now, every single day on earth. Uh, and you're not there to witness it all. So do they not matter in your life? You know, did, the, did only the ones that you witness um, have meaning or deeper value? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so I don't like this narrative. It's way too often used, I think. And how do you benefit or how do you learn from, from issues that have nothing to do with you? Uh, because I don't believe in coincidence at all. I, I don't, I, I think that we walk into or experience whatever was set up in our lives. Like we made decisions that led to a moment and this was the moment. And I made decisions that led to a moment and the moment I walked into was this. And what was so crazy to me was that as I was standing there, I'm, you know, far off, I'm not like close to what's happening. Other people who are like had gone around too are just running by, just running by, like uh, unaware or I don't know. <laughs> unaware. Um, I think they're minding their, it's called minding their own business and not uh, making it about them. Uh, someone else's life is happening, a uh, tragedy is occurring. They're not making it about themselves, <laughs> unlike you. The second thing that I thought about a lot, and I have thought about this many times over the years, and maybe if you've ever lost someone close to you, maybe you've experienced this thought as well. But one of the weirdest, most awful, most beautiful parts of life is that at any second in the day, someone dies and there are people whose life as they know it is over in that moment. Like they are still living, but the life that they had is over. It's done. It's everything has changed. They are devastated by this blow. But for the rest of the world, it's just a Sunday morning. Rachel's mentioned in other interviews. Um, well, I'll see if I can find it. But if not, I promise you, this is something that she said um, that her parents never asked her if she was okay after discovering her brother deceased. I have never had a conversation with my parents about 
what I saw, how it felt. Was I scared? Did I need anything? Um, that seems crazy. It, it's crazy. Like I have the amount of conversations I've had with my sons about Fortnite, 1,000. And I have not talked to my parents about, because they were so, and I say this in the book, like I can't even imagine what it would feel like to have your 17 year old son take his life. I cannot imagine that. But I know for a fact, I, there is not a question in my mind that I would not find a way, even if it was bullshit, even if it was fake, to keep showing up for my kids. And that's horrible. Her parents, that is a total fault of theirs for not being concerned about their daughter who is still with them. And you deserve, Rachel deserved her parents to care enough about her to ask her if she was okay. Um, and that didn't happen according to her. So that's messed up. And you know, rightfully so, she doesn't talk to her parents much anymore. I think that's probably a good idea if that's the kind, kind of you know, way that they treat her. It's the craziest thing. I remember so distinctly the morning that my brother died. This was, oh my gosh, um, 24 years ago. God, it's crazy. It's been that long. Yeah, 24 years ago. So we didn't have phones. We didn't have digital pictures. We didn't have things like that. And we were all, the whole family was obviously an absolute mess. And my mom was inconsolable and she wanted pictures of Ryan. She just wanted a picture. And it just so happened that we had gone on a trip recently. Ryan and I had gone on a trip with my dad and those pictures were already at the photo center at Walmart. Like there's a time, and like some of you are having a blast from the past right now, but there's a time where you would, you know, you took your pictures on film and then you had to take it down somewhere and then have it processed. And so it was being processed at Walmart and the, the afternoon. So he died in the morning in the afternoon. I remember my cousin, because my mom was like inconsolable. And I was like, wait, there's pictures, there's pictures at Walmart. And so my cousin took me down to the Walmart to go get the pictures. And I remember just walking around so numb and in shock that for everyone else, it was just Monday afternoon. Like my world was over. My hero was dead. And for everybody else, it was just Monday. And there's something so painful about that. And also there's something so beautiful about that, that the world just keeps pushing forward. Uh, I don't think it has to be beautiful, Rachel. Like it doesn't have to be. Things can just be shitty. Things can just be bad. Um... That's the thing I think with these self-help gurus and even in her introduction saying like, it's gonna be positive though. This whole thing isn't all negative because you know me, Rachel, I'm the most positive person ever. Do things suck. <laughs> things just suck. There's not a lesson buried in everything. There's not a lesson buried in every bad thing that happens because when you say that, and that's the narrative you go with, it makes it seem like somehow you were asking for it to happen. And I know that's a stretch, but hear me out. Let's say something happened to you as a kid that was not good. Um, but you learned from it and you got stronger. Some people will say, well, that was meant to happen to you to get you to be stronger. And I say, it shouldn't have happened at all. It sucked. I did the best thing I could with what happened, but it shouldn't have happened. And to say that, oh, that was meant to be so I could become a stronger person, it's insulting. And, you know, this whole thing with self-help and don't be a victim, who does that help? <laughs> it helps the perpetrator. It doesn't help you. You're a victim either way. But not declaring yourself a victim only makes the perpetrator not have a victim. And there's a lot I could talk about this, and there's a lot of things that we could unpack with victimhood and how it gets such a negative rap in the self-help space that it, in my opinion, should not. Um, when it comes to cults and uh, manipulation, the, the number one thing that, that cult leaders will say is stop being a victim, stop playing the victim. Tony Robbins does it. The guy that um, Keith Raniere, who did Nexium, talked about it. A lot of people who want to manipulate you um, into thinking that you're not a victim when you are a victim, they're probably victimizing you. <laughs> So that's a side tangent, but I think, you know, Rachel is so enmeshed into this world of self-help that she also plays into that role. Rachel is a victim of having a really bad traumatic experience happen to her 
with her brother's case. And she's a victim of that. It doesn't make her lesser of a person for being a victim in that situation. She's still a strong, independent woman. She's a mother. She's a business owner. None of that is erased because she's also a victim in this one scenario. On the same show yesterday where I saw this thing, this horrible thing, I saw little kids learning to ride their first bike. And I saw ducks. And I saw birthday parties. It's like this beautiful thing about life that it holds both. And it was a good reminder. And I think it's impossible to see loss or death and not ask yourself how you're living. How are you living? Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but it is impossible for me to be aware of someone dying, someone I know, or a friend of a friend, or in this case, whatever was happening yesterday. It's impossible for me to see that and not ask myself, if today was it, if today was your last day, are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of the way you're living? Are you proud of the way that you're showing up as a mother? Are you proud of how you love well as a friend? Are you proud of yourself as a leader? Are you proud of yourself? Are you, are you proud? And pride doesn't mean achievement. Pride isn't about a list of successes that you pile up on each other. For me, pride is like, man, did I love well? Was I kind? Did I laugh? Was I present? I spent a lot of time yesterday thinking about that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time yesterday thinking about that. And then the last thought is I was just like astounded at human emotion and energy. I wish, I wish I knew the name of this guy that was working so hard yesterday. I wish that I, I wish I could send him a note and I wish I could tell him that I saw the courage and the bravery and the fear. And I, I watched, even from afar, I watched this human literally try to give their energy and their life force to someone else. Try to give it with like, couldn't, couldn't see that it was hopeless. First of all, tried to give his life force to this other human that was dying that had no chance. How do you know he had no chance? He could have had a chance, right? Like people's hearts restart. Uh, CPR does work. That's why it's taught to people for years um, to help these matters. So there's no, it's just, it seems like she's very much on this train of there is no hope. There never was hope. The trying was in vain for no reason. And somehow because the person was such a kind person trying to give his life to this other person, that's the only reason that CPR is being done in the first place. Not because there was protocols in place, not because there was a faint heartbeat, um, only purely because this young strapping paramedic has some sort of superhuman uh, caring in his heart. The other people who are standing around, the older people, the, the ones who maybe had been through this before, they all knew. I knew from far, I have no training, from far away, I knew what I was seeing. But this kid, this guy, he was trying so hard. He was trying to will his intent into something that was never going to, it wasn't going to work. No matter how pure his intention and no matter how much love and no matter how he wanted so desperately to help. It was time. It was that person's time. Well, she says she's got no training. We knew that. Um... Also, uh, did you talk to these older paramedics afterwards and confirm that that's what they were thinking? Because it's a lot to put on someone else to say that they knew that there was no hope for this person, but the young, and for some reason, the young paramedic with less experience was uh, instructed or, or took on the responsibility to single-handedly bring this person back <laughs> from the dead. So it doesn't seem that um, this story is completely thought out, but there's, uh, maybe it is, but a lot of it is coming from Rachel Hollis's brain and not necessarily what actually is happening in reality. To say like this guy has so much goodness in his heart to try to get to revive him. I really think I'm going back to what my original theory was is that Rachel sees herself in that young paramedic. That's who she's, she's projecting her feelings about herself onto this man in a way to story tell about how she tried so hard to keep her family together, her marriage together, her business together, and how it, there was no chance of it ever happening. It was dead. There was nothing that she could do, even though she's got the purest heart in the world. Um, that she could do that. She, she, it was a failure. She, there was nothing she could do to save the life that she had built. 
um, I think that's why she's projecting so much onto this guy who could be a jerk, who could be a normal person, who could just be doing the job that he was told to do. Um, that's why I think she's putting all of this positivity onto him, putting all these things in his personality that may or may not exist because she is comparing herself to him. And I couldn't help but think about how often as humans, we try and do this with other humans. How often do you try so desperately to help? Your whole heart and your whole being goes into trying to give your love and your energy and your life force into someone. And it's just never, it's never going to work. And here comes the hook. <laughs> So now you've been following the story, which may or may not be true, and now it comes into the, the, the sermon really begins, the lesson of the day. It's like, it really made me think, how often do we do this as humans? And now we're into phase two, where the story starts to connect back into, you know, what lesson are you supposed to learn from, from this uh, vague story? I just feel like we believe so deeply and we want to help so desperately. And there are times when everybody else around you can see that what you're literally doing is running yourself into exhaustion, running yourself, depleting yourself, trying so hard. And I know that I'm using an analogy about something really serious. But I don't care. Is <laughs> the true uh, <laughs> ending to that. But I wonder how many people listening to this are staying with an abusive partner, are trying again and again and again to help a parent kick the addiction, are believing that if they just love hard enough or work hard enough or figure it all out, that you can fix this person, that you can make it right, that you can give them the will and the intent to change. And God, the truth is that sometimes, sometimes you can't. And I don't know, I don't know the answers to this because I think that as a human, you have every right to keep trying until it begins to hurt you. So she's really casting a wide net of, oh, everyone's going to be able to relate to this, misrelatable, um, because it's not just the scenario at hand. She, she made this scenario general enough that every single person can see themselves connecting to this analogy. And I don't think that's an accident. I think this is very well designed, and this is her taking a chance to see if she could be a evangelical self-help guru. I think you have every right to try and make the marriage work until it begins to hurt you. I think that the first time, the first time that they laid hands on you should have been the last time that you ever interacted with them. But I also know that life doesn't always go that way. I, I wanted to talk about this because I just thought, damn, I don't have the answers for you, but maybe we should ask some questions. Maybe we should ask if it's appropriate for you as the child to try and fix the parent. Maybe we should ask if it's safe for you to be in relationship with your sister when she's this toxic and this hateful and this emotionally abusive. Maybe we should ask ourselves, every single person listening to this, if there is a situation in our life where we are trying to impose our will for the best reasons, for the best reasons with love, with like so much love and so much goodness. We're trying to make something, trying to put ourselves into someone else in the hopes of saving them, but we're doing it. You're doing it in a way that's killing you. And here we go again. So now it's not just the scenario at hand, her retelling a story about what happened to her to connect to her audience to, to like unload some of her emotional baggage. But now it's, okay, are you a child or were you a child trying to fix your parents? Were you um, in a toxic relationship? And it really is one of the, it's almost like a commercial, like, do you have a beating heart and lungs? If so, this product will work for you. Uh, it's the same tactic because yes, oh, I, huh? I do. My heart, lungs, yes, that's me. Oh my God, I gotta run out to the store right now and get it. Um, but it, it's like, that's fine, but I just hate the disingenuine setup where it's like, I gotta just be raw with you guys. I just gotta like get this off my heart. And then, you know, it goes into this whole scripted, pre thought out, like very, you know, uh, not specific, but like a very, smart analogy to appeal to a large group of people. <laughs> I know it happens all the time and it's part of the game. It's part of like being a preacher, being an author, whatever. But I just, I, it bothers me to set it up as if it's like an off the cuff conversation. <sighs> That's just a personal thing. I hate being lied to and being manipulated. So, 
you know. I really love people when they're being raw, actually raw. I can appreciate it so much. I hate when the false rawness is used is as a way to bring you in, to make you feel like, oh, I'm really opening up, I'm connecting with you. And then like the reality, it's to sell you some BS. You know, yesterday I feel like, I feel like what I saw was the other people, maybe the, the more seasoned people who thought, we just have to let them try, right? We just have to let this kid try. And maybe that's you right now. Maybe you're not ready to let go. Maybe you just right now feel like you have to keep doing it this way. But I'm recording this because I believe in my heart that someone, and even if it's only one person, needed to hear this today so that they could ask themselves if they're trying to will someone else, some situation, some project, some relationship into what they want it to be instead of seeing what actually is. I don't have the answers, but I'm really good at asking questions, mostly of myself and today for you too. So... I hope, I hope you got something out of this. And if it was discombobulated and made no sense, I apologize. Just felt like I don't believe in coincidence. And so maybe one of you needed to hear this too. I now have listened to this three times and I, this is the first time I really think that it's fake. Um, I don't think that there's any truth to the scenario. My opinion, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but just because of how in depth she got into all the other examples and scenarios and how clearly she defined the roles of this fake, uh, in my opinion, fake scenario, um, I really don't think it happened. I think it would be such, and I honestly hope it didn't happen because if this person really died in front of her eyes and this is what she came out with to <laughs> say about it, um, didn't mention his family or what they might be going through, didn't do any follow-up and say, hey, I found out what it was, didn't do anything to actually, like didn't send the family money or food or uh, condolences. Like at least she didn't say that she had interest in that. She just turned it into monetizable content on her podcast. So let's hope for her sake that this is a fake story. However, it is very uh, not, a good look to be lying about things you know i think uh you should say you know i was thinking about a hypothetical situation and then i came i thought about this and then this happened and what if this and this or i was reading a story and it reminded me of this instead of coming up with this fake thing where it's like i was witness to a death because i am special and i was put here to witness this to tell you this story about how you should, you know, stay away from your toxic sister. It's like, we've traveled a long way from where we began in this podcast. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, this is the type of content uh, that you will probably see at her conference. You know, this evangelical style, inspirational, take no prisoners, you know, stand up for yourself and stop being the victim type of speech that gets you to cry and smile and stand up with your fist in the air. And, you know, that's all fine and dandy if you're into that thing. Obviously, I'm not very much into that thing anymore uh, because I've seen how toxic it can become um, for these companies and for these gurus' heads to literally explode because their, their, their ego is so large. Um, she's got another episode. This will be another video. This video has already gotten super, super long. Um, so there's another podcast that she recently just posted where she talks about Dave. And um, I think she makes some or she makes some slight accusations that I, I think are interesting um, that I think we should discuss. And even though she said she'll never talk about Dave ever again, um, she spends the whole podcast talking about Dave <laughs> and how messed up he was, which I agree with her. You know, I don't like him either, but... Um, stick to your guns, you know, pick, pick, pick a side. Are you going to talk about him or are you not going to talk about him? Um, let's discuss that in the next video. And also, if you have not subscribed, but you're thinking about it, you're teetering on the edge of clicking the button, um, click it. <laughs> so I was sitting in my room in my office and I saw a bird outside and the bird clicked on the subscribe button. And it made me think, that's what you should do you should click on that subscribe button and also comment. The bird commented and said that they love this video and all my videos, which made me think that you should do that too. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that's all the time I have. Um, goodbye.
is nice seeing you. See you in the next one.